Um, to say now that the European influence on theatre at that time was far different and that they're having a tougher time now because of an Asian influence. They're not as interested in theatre for some reason. Mm -hmm. Or at least in, uh, in the kind of theatre, I suppose, that Winnipeg and Mantua Theatre Center have been presenting over the years. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, it may not be you know, relevant for them. We'll find something. I think theater in general is down a little bit. Um, I think so. But attendance of opera is apparently way up. Keanu Reeves maybe drove it up. Yeah. Eh? Oh, yeah, that's right. He played it in that really didn't, didn't get the greatest reviews, but the teenage girls liked him fine. I liked him. Pretty gutsy thing to do. Oh, yeah. For anyone. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, it could be he wants to learn how to act. Sure. Who knows? <laughs> and he's nice looking. Though. Okay. Um, have we covered Tom Henry pretty well uh, already? Tom, anything we want to add about Tom right now, Tom Henry, as a writer? Um, you ranked his all too brief satiric radio series as one of the best of its kind in the country. Mm -hmm. Do you think mm -hmm. that he showed a particular acuity? There was a sense that, um, or that particular um, radio comedy thing, although probably now in Tom's memory of things, uh, um, it, uh, it was, you know, does not hold a, a, a great, great space of consideration. But I, I felt it was good. I had great admiration for anybody who could sit down and put things down like that. He did that. He wrote a play called 15 Miles of Broken Glass which became a television thing and stage, but, and I was in that as well. He did a wonderful, wonderfully funny uh, um, melodrama that we put on Rainbow Stage called Pitfalls of Pauline, and it was great fun. I played Alan Allworthy as hero, and, and uh, there were some funny, marvelous actors in it. We had a, such a good time, but I couldn't get past the fact that it was, that it was in the writing, really, that made it work. Um, and I guess in the, in the years, in the succeeding years, I probably have thought that it's a shame in a way um, that he hasn't uh, had a, a playing field, a writing field that, was far, that, would, that would show his work off much more, much better. I'm sure he had, uh, uh, has had an awful lot to talk about and write about over the years, but maybe the uh, the atmosphere was not conducive to it. I I, I just don't uh, I just don't know uh, what happened there. But I suppose in each person's story, it's um, they find themselves going one way or another and not getting everything done they'd like to. All I know is that uh, again, I have to to uh, he, Tom was represented for me one of those first go getters, you know in theater and uh, made things happen where otherwise uh, doors would, might have remained closed for a lot of performers coming out of Winnipeg at that time. Mm. And John Hirsch, of course, uh, how, did, how did they compare contrast, please, uh, Henry Hirsch? John was, um, we'll start with Tom. Tom, Tom. Tom didn't want ever to uh, uh, to uh, stop, to uh, no, let's start again. <laughs> Tom wanted certain things done for the local theater, for the sake of Winnipeg audiences and having its own professional theater. John would be the instrument in making this happen from the standpoint of uh, directorial uh, and uh, creative know-how. Uh, Tom certainly would not do anything to, to, to stop that um, from happening, so therefore he uh, generously stayed a bit in the background, uh, did his work, the work that was required of him as a producer and as a builder, in a sense, of, of local theater allowed John to go out and do some of the, uh, the more showy work, public work, 
uh, he would go to he would go on speaking engagements and talk himself up around the community and the theater and he became the better known of the two I suppose in that in that way of speaking um, uh, but there was no uh, no question that that uh, Tom was like the uh, the baffle to all of that you know that sort of baffle board he was the one who was making it all happen in the first place and and uh, I always thought he uh, needed a great deal of, of credit I'm not sure he got all of the credit he should have got and uh, he was uh, he was extremely fine extremely fine uh, I had great admiration for him and still do and and it's um, it's odd now to see some of those same people in such in, in a much larger community of theater action around this around this country and sometimes we get a bit lost but they always come back out again if they if they have the kind of abilities that Tom has and uh, he's he's doing fine as for John I a quarter of yours said he directed us out of our minds and into a lifelong love of work what do you mean exactly by directed out of your minds well I think he sort of took us off took us out of ourselves took us off the street in the sense of uh, of um, uh, Winnipeg of the Times, most people, or well, pro probably everybody, doing day work, different kinds, arriving at a center where something was being put together, um, and you would become part of a team where everybody was thinking the same way, and there was something hugely important and different about that certainly for the very young actor because they've never really experienced anything like it before and the Captain Ahab in charge of this was Hirsch and uh, I couldn't help feel that um, that this was home that every time you stepped into that theater you were not only allowed to step into the theater and privileged but here was your chance to grow and uh, and make this impression and splatter your colors and your paint wherever you wanted to from the standpoint of of the uh, performing artist sensibilities and and he was there to understand it appreciate it bring it out put it back in and shape you in a way that um, or allow you to shape yourself in a, in, in a way that you would uh, end up with with the confidence it would take, that self-assurance that it would take for you to uh, to go on to um, bigger and better things, I guess. That's uh, fairly vague, though. Uh, if he was eloquent analogy that he was your Captain Ahab, but then who was the white whale? You know? What was the white whale? Hard to say. Oh, well, I suppose the, the white whale was theater itself, and uh, certainly theater in Winnipeg at that point. There was no indication, no assurance that um, Winnipeg, which had one time before been a theater town in the sense that they had theater to go to and they enjoyed theater, there was no real assurance that it would ever happen again that way. But he struggled with it, made it happen, and struggle is not the right word because it, he, it he made it look as though, this is natural, folks. You must have this in your community. It must be. There is a place downtown called, and you will go to it, and you will enjoy it, and see that you have something quite splendid, and it's all yours here. Winnipeg was, in its own way, an isolated kind of thing, on the, on the, with prairie around it. And any good things that happened in Winnipeg, um, the Philharmonic was built, the whole downtown center, cultural center, built down, down in the middle of Winnipeg, it was really done by Winnipeg for Winnipeg. Not so much for people traveling through or anything else, but saying, hey, this is for us. We want, we want this. John allowed, might even have opened the door to that kind of thinking at that time with things like the Manitoba Theatre Center. And uh, from the very beginning, there was something um, in it that showed the theatre going public they were um, that this was a professional undertaking and would be in very short order and they would be seeing this theater as fine as theater anywhere in the world
And John had a way of getting that message across. I hate to backstep into a couple of questions about Theater 77. Um, jumping back a slight bit. Um, how did it get it, its name? You know? Got its name by, um, I think there's 77 steps from the corner of Portage of Maine from the corner of Portage Maine to the theater. Nothing, nothing grander than that, really. <laughs> I have a feeling it was, it, uh, it came at the end of that first long walk to that theater, probably uh, while negotiations or uh, early chit-chats were going on between Tom and John in putting that theater together. And uh, it wasn't any more romantic than that, I don't think. Speaking of first long walks, uh, were you in the Italian straw hat? I was, I was, yes. Okay, you remember that well? I do indeed, I do indeed. I, um, uh, I've often said, and I'm quite sure I'm not just, I, I don't think I'm imagining it. I think I was the very first actor to step on stage for the Theatre 77. I was a, uh, a butler. I didn't have a lot to do, but I'm pretty sure I was the first one. <laughs> to step on stage. And uh, so that, that was kind of nice. I say that because in the year or two that followed, I could tell that John was pretty eager on capturing the imagination, the uh, acceptance of, the, 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 uh, the uh, attention of Toronto and the outside kind of, kind of, um, uh, credit that perhaps uh, he should be getting uh, at that time and in using the theater as his vehicle in which to get it. Uh, and it was a good, uh, now where was I? Oops, there it goes, there, go there it goes. What was I saying? Oh yeah, you should. It was the, uh, we were talking about the Italian straw hat and how um Yes, 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 okay, okay. Yeah, you well, you can use the first part of that, can't you? Yes, that was nice, how you started. <laughs> you said you, didn't, you were a butler, you didn't have much to do, and I was thinking, but the butler did it. Anyway. The butler did it. Okay. No, he didn't. Okay. Oh, but, um, as I say, in the, in the year or two to follow, John uh, was very eager on getting uh, the attention of Toronto and the uh, theater across the country and so on. And he started to pull actors, performers, professional performers, uh, from those centers to Winnipeg to uh, promote the idea of the Manitoba Theatre Center. And uh, fine, absolutely no reason why he shouldn't have, shouldn't have done that. Um, when I hear from some of these actors now that they were the first actors at the Manitoba Theatre Center, it makes me feel a little kind of warm. Um, because in fact it had been going on for a year or two before that with a lot of struggle, a lot of scratching and grabbing and trying to put that theatre together. Um, amongst the people who really cared enough to stay and do that, do that particular job. Uh, we all took part in all aspects of it. Again, you know, as they always say, you know, help with sets, drove trucks, did all that stuff. And uh, yes, uh, back to an earlier question of yours, we, uh, we pretty well came out of the streets and into that theater and changed, changed people having uh, those creative doors opened for us by John. And um, a lot of us coming from different, quite different kinds of work. I taught dancing at Arthur Murray's. I uh, painted signs at a sign, uh, a, a display industry, and uh, did a bit of commercial art and local portraiture and oils and uh, just about anything. Worked at the uh, Manitoba Hydro and, oh, anyway, any numbers of kinds of jobs and would show up um, for work and go on stage as though it was the only thing, really, I was interested in doing. Uh, well. It's illuminating, all right. Um, opening night, there's a rumor there was a telegram from the Royal Palace. Is this true? Telegram from the Queen. Whoa. What did that happen? Whoa. According to Henry, that was according to Henry. <laughs> well, and a contentious party afterwards. And a contentious party. He didn't say uh, particularly what he meant. By wow. That, for he, the opening night. He didn't mention a particular show, did he? Or no. Mess, well, no. It could have been an Italian straw hat, I suppose. Hmm. 
Yeah, Something like that was happening at the time, but I, I, isn't that peculiar? That's right. really escaped me. It comes back. That uh, shows you how, how uh, consumed we were by our own <laughs> job at the time. Yeah. Forgot. Didn't recognize the queen walking through. But yeah. <laughs> One of uh, your most memorable performances was at Johnny Pope in Half Full of Rain. Mm -hmm. um, apparently, according to Henry, that you'd put in a lot of research for this special, hard uh, research, and that the audience, some fainted, some were sick. Like, what was with this role, Half Full of Rain? What did you do? Today, it would be uh, Anne of Green Gables in comparison to half the things that are done, you know. But at that time, it was one of the earliest plays on uh, dope addiction and so on. Oddly enough, I appeared in another one here in Winnipeg that came off off Broadway called The Connection a few years um, after. But that particular one was, um, yes, a bit of a turning point, a bit, a bit scary at the time. Very real stuff that was going on because other kinds of productions that were happening were uh, uh, the old, again, old standards. So you did your arsenic and old lace, or you did death of a salesman, and you did all those varying things, glass menagerie and so on. Hatful of Rain was one of the, was at that time the newer kind of play, as quickly as you could get it off Broadway. And uh, it was first played by Ben Gazzara and followed up by Steve McQueen on Broadway. And um, I was, I felt really, lucky to get this thing, but of course one did anyway, and any of that sort of thing that was going on. Because it also meant that um, that John, who was who was uh, mastering the ship, um, had that kind of confidence in you to take those kinds of roles on and so on, and he was able to see me jumping from one absolute other kind of role to, to this one of Johnny Pope. Uh, and uh, it, it, was, it was simply that the audiences were seeing elements of a kind of play that they had not seen before to do with the dope addiction and so on and the, and the drama built around it, you know. Terribly real stuff and uh, pretty gritty at the time. The Beacon Theatre, do you remember that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell me about it, uh, the venue, was it a Be real nice place? Beacon Theatre probably would have been and probably was when it first uh, it was a, it was a, uh, a new house. Um, again, I don't recall an awful lot of work being done at the Beacon Theater. I think it was a th movie house for quite a while. It might have been a stage house before that. I have no idea. Um, my only real memory of the Beacon is going back on a return visit to Winnipeg doing Two for the Seesaw with a local actress, lovely, marvelous person, Lillian Lewis. And... Uh, we did two for the seesaw, brought back from Toronto um, at no expense <laughs> to uh, perform back in Winnipeg again. So it was like homecoming for me. And um, well, we happened to, to do it on, uh, on the Beacon stage. Uh, it, was, it was interesting. I remember the opening night was bought out by Hadassah, the Jewish organization, and my friend Perry Rosemond. And I used to spend a lot of time with him and his family, and I stayed there many times. And we came out of the theater after the opening, after the opening night, and a lot of these people hadn't been to the theater before, a couple of them, or a few of them, or whatever, and Perry said to some old gentleman, well, Isaac, how did you like Gordon tonight? Isaac said, Gordon, so help me God, I thought it was a movie. <laughs> <laughs> that was my, that was, <laughs> so I felt, <laughs> okay, I'll buy that. Uh, 16 feet high. <laughs> <laughs> that's local acclamation. <laughs> so, I praise. Did you do Death of a Salesman there, by the way? Certainly did, was yes. The yes. I think he left the Dominion because the roof needed repair or something. That was the story. And then you went over to the Beacon. Uh, anyhow, you and Henry both said Death of a Salesman sort of put Winnipeg Theatre on the map or resurrected it? I think so. I think that was the feeling. It was the first one. Uh, it wasn't at the Beacon, by the way. It was at the Dominion. Yeah. Um, it, had that, it had that feeling about it. We're, this, this was grown up now. We could, we have, we'd have, we've done our Alice in Wonderlands and our 
varying other kinds of kinds of plays. There was something about Death of a Salesman. Again, John, uh, not that long out of Hungary, you know, really, but had this uncanny ability to be able to create or recreate drama according to American or Canadian sensibilities or whatever in, in such an expert fashion. He was so good at what he did. So marvelous. And you wanted to be good for him. And, and it was that, that's, you know, that kind of feeling that went along with it. Death of a Salesman was uh, um, full of such, uh, such I, I think, good performing, good, good directing from John. And uh, I think it was a wake-up call for Winnipeg audiences. You know, that there was better theater coming along, good theater coming along. And um, the critics loved it as well, and we just plain knew they would, you know? It had that marvelous, you had that grip on it, and you just felt we're on our way. Anything after that, they were coming out to see us as Winnipeg performers, doing work, uh, showing off the, uh, the varying sides of our, you know, performing personas, and, uh, and they enjoying it immensely, you know. It was a good, fine time. Yeah. One of your memories of this production, forgive me for mining, um, it was amusing that uh, one actress, when she saw that props had forget, forgotten to give her a pair of um, opera glasses. <laughs> uh, She's she going to kill me, you know. Oh, well, you don't have to name her, particularly, do you? <laughs> no, no. no. Oh, could, could you tell that one? Well, it was just a <laughs> uh, uh, There was a, uh, my character, Hap, sitting on stage at a restaurant table with a waiter who was played by Donnelly Rhodes. Yeah, played Stanley, a waiter. And uh, there were a couple of uh, loose women standing on stage at the time, um, uh, looking for uh, uh, some sort of a company and things. Anyway, they passed, they walked past this particular little table and, uh, and, I, and I said to the waiter, get a load of those binoculars. And that night, that was a dress rehearsal, and that night while everyone was worrying and stewing over the show to come, because we're all getting ready now to do the show, the opening, she was crying in her dressing room, and she, I, was, I said, are you okay, darling? What's, what's, what's wrong? And she said, oh, she said, I don't bother anyone because we're all sort of into our own sort of things, but she said, it just doesn't seem fair. Everyone's got their props but me. When am I going to get my binoculars? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, no, no, don't, 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 don't say that to anyone else. Just, I promise I won't tell. <laughs> so, but finally comes up. That's so cute. Huh? Um, yeah. Uh, did Tom know that story? By the way, I, I, I'm quite sure he did. Uh, he might have, but I didn't have it from him. <laughs> um, uh, um, can you talk about your relationship with John Hirsch, the giggling that irritated you? In other words, the, his mannerisms, particularly, you know, uh, the fact that uh, <clears throat> he was so truthful. Well, you've already talked about that. Yes, John was not afraid. Mm -hmm. um, he was tall, gangly. I was never one to really be that uh, occupied with this, preoccupied with, with appearance or anything else. He was always a bit scruffy and sort of uh, always on the move. Uh, coming from or going to some some idea in the making, some special kind of work that he was he was on to and uh, plans and ideas for the future and for a, a given show that he might be working on. But um, he, uh, well, he had, he had certain mannerisms. He needed to get these messages across to you, this, this sort of direction across to you. And so there was a lot of snapping, a lot of snapping of fingers in the wings, a lot of uh, um, vocal sounds, and and um, from from the uh, from the theater and so on, while you were attempting to get a certain kind of thing done. And uh, there was always that, and he'd always stand right in your face, especially if you were doing a musical and trying to sing. John would be singing right along with you, even though he couldn't sing. So you get the same mannerisms, and you get this whole thing until you 
just had to, you know, tell them to sit down or do something with them. So that sort of thing went on. But um, basically, uh, I laughed a lot. I was a huge giggler. Now I'm sure there are an amazing number of people who are who can, who can claim that as well. It was a terrible thing to do, and it happened because. I obviously didn't have an understanding of how you stepped out of yourself and into the sensibility of the performer or of the character you were playing, whereby you could gauge, uh, you know, and direct yourself into just which facets, you know, were his or yours as, as the, uh, the person acting the role. Because, in fact, I laughed at everything as I would have normally. So I was actor and audience at the same time, and it just destroyed John. John would have to leave the theater in great huffs. And I, just as I would sort of achieve a moment of some kind of, you know, where I was fulfilling what John was, was after, I'd be gone. I'd just be gone. I'd be dissolved for some silly reason, because I found great enjoyment out of the written word and out of drama and comedy and theater in general. So it was that sort of thing, and uh, to the point where I think uh, I barely made it to the stage some nights, you know. Uh, he never liked that so much. John would always say to me at parties afterwards, be sensitive. Be a lot more sensitive, Gordon. So. At parties, what kind of dude was he? Oh, he was fine. He was uh, relieved that a show had opened or something was successful, whatever. But you just knew he was the one person in that room that already was steps ahead. He was uh, already somewhere else in some other new new piece of work. Some John Hall also, I, I, I suspect, had an inner uh, sense of um, something very much not finished. And maybe it was a writing thing. Maybe it was a kind of, definitely a creative thing that he had no answers for. And he just knew that, that it was there somewhere, but he had not done it himself, he had not completed himself, some idea of himself or, you know, that he would like to have. Uh, maybe it was in just simply in that future piece of work, the next job, the next job after that. I remember seeing him dancing, of all things, of all people to have seen dancing, this flamingo, this strange looking bird-like man at these cast parties leaping all over the place. And I think he, oh, I remember thinking at the time he doesn't want to land. He doesn't want to land. He wants to stay up there because if you land, he's going to walk around like the rest of us. He had to be different. He always had to be on the move, trying to find some new um, and enlarged version, you know, of of life as it was on the, in, in reality. You know, he just needed that extra space to move in, and he needed people to uh, help him do that. Some of us accomplished it for him but not always, and uh, you were always pleasing him, you know, trying to at least. Building is just is exactly right. I used to do that stuff before I was an actor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. As I was talking about, well, to hate to bring a little cliches, but your, I suppose your birth certificate would have made you pre-Canadian, in a sense, say, from... Uh, yeah. You were technically born in the yeah. UK, pre-49. That's right. That's uh, right, yeah. Did that make you a British subject, by the way? Uh, no, Newfoundland was then going through its... Um, no, as a matter of fact, I wish it had because I could have worked in England more. Yeah, through your kids too. Or? Yeah, but uh, no, we were still we were somewhere in the middle. Oh. I think we were. If the war had continued, we were going to be traded for battleships or something. I think we were just. I don't know what we were at that time. You were, we were at the hopscotch point for the Americans. Yeah, States. they were trying to make up their minds which way they were going to go. Um, commission government, responsible government, or uh, economic union states. Or confederation. I wonder if it was the best thing that happened. I mean, I hope. So. I think it is. Yeah. I think it is. Oh. Well, it seems logical. Yes. Have you run your bars and your things and all that? Right. Let's get into it so, like, we can get. On. He's done it all. Yeah. He's yeah. he's done the work. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. I'm gonna be leaping way, way right back. Leap away, my okay. friend. Leap okay. away. So let's start with. We're talking about Newfoundland. Did you ever see the London Theatre Company? The London Theatre Company. Oh, no. <laughs> How's that? No. As a matter of fact, uh, although I knew that in St. John's there was activity going on, 
um, of the kind that that uh, we weren't, uh, uh, you know, subject to um, in in the central part of Newfoundland. Um, the London Theatre Company was something that uh, I'd heard about much later, and uh, apparently it was very successful. Some of those same actors, most of them I'd worked with since. And uh, they had a wonderful, wonderful time down there, and St. John's was lucky to have had its own semi-professional or whatever company uh, on their uh, territory at that time. And that was uh, 51 to 56, I believe they were. Uh... The London? No. Oops. No, pardon me. You left around then. Eh? I think it was in the 40s. Oh, sorry, what is? Hold on. Hold on. Sorry. This is okay, let's, let's start that one again, <laughs> J.D. <laughs> Start that one again, so we can decide decipher on uh, okay. the London, because I, to be perfectly honest, I wasn't yeah, even entirely sure that that's what it was called. So what I have is Leslie Yeo was touring with them, fifty-one to fifty-six. So can you erase that stuff? We'll start yeah, sure. again. Good, thank you. Okay. Um, Can we state that for the record? Yeah. Basically, restart. Okay. 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 All righty. Uh, the London Theatre Company. So, well, we didn't really have much to add on that. You left. Uh, let's just start then when you when you when you left Newfoundland and, and you went to Manitoba. I left Newfoundland on um, August forty-eight. Um, six months, I guess, before. We became part of Canada, and um, after a number of jobs, ended up in, in Winnipeg. Um, sort of a, a roundabout way of getting to Toronto, where I'd always wanted to visit, work, and so on. And uh, eventually did, and was lucky enough in stopping off in Winnipeg to, uh, to be included in local theater, and television, radio, and things of that nature. I heard this anecdote that you were uh, attending Winnipeg Repertory Theater a rehearsal or something like that. It was a Ms. Uh, Lovegrove, I believe. Yes, yes, a wonderful lady called Lena Lovegrove, yes. Mm -hmm. She uh, kept Winnipeg Theater going, pretty much, in the amateur uh, level, um, through some very uh, sort of um, um, laps, lapsing times <laughs> of, of theater uh, there. Uh, I remember her mentioning the John Holden players that had come through Winnipeg and that uh, the Winnipeg Little Theatre was going, the Music Guild, things of that nature. Um, again, seasonal things, but not really, n not really uh, on, a, on, a, on a steady kind of basis. Her theatre was called the Winnipeg Repertory theater and um, she would put on shows and they would last for three nights only and she'd put them on in places like the uh, YMCA, YMHA, things of that nature. Any stage that she could find. Her husband was a wonderful man who worked at Malabar's uh, in the costumery and kind of world and um, and Lena Lovegrove uh, adored theater, just was one of those great ladies. And almost every community you go into, there is a Lena Lovegrove who's the mainstay of local theater on an amateur level. And uh, we had some very fine people working there and coming out of Winnipeg um, before I got there and, and, uh, and afterwards and so on. But uh, You mentioned you'd done a few jobs beforehand. Did you really aspire to uh, acting? Always. Always did. Didn't know if I had the m makings for it. That's not entirely true. I think I might have known that, but I, I, I really didn't know, the, you know, the route that one, that one would have to take in order to make it a reality. I, um, I, I didn't know enough about it. I just simply had that, that uh, the, the guts, I guess, or some sort of youthful, uh, you know. Uh, deliberateness that would that would sort of take me take me into that field, but uh, it was a uh, it was where I was going. No two ways about it. Yeah. 
the chutzpah, I think was the word, maybe. Yeah. That's the one. <laughs> and coming and coming from uh, doing doing my early theater work in Winnipeg in the. Uh, Closely connected with the uh, the Jewish community there, I should have known that. Well, uh, it was remarkable. You played little places in Winnipeg because they really had some splendid theaters there, didn't they? Some great, great theater houses. And this was a time when the touring companies had largely kind of collapsed. Did you find yourself playing in any of the greater? I mean, the the European and Americans touring and the Dominion Drama Festival was probably winding down around this time. Did you find yourself playing in any of the great houses when you were like? Uh, Years. The Winnipeg houses. Well, basically, um, all I know is that w that we were in a in a theater called the Dominion Theater. It was built. It was a tradition. Had a traditional sort of a, a look about it. Manitoba Theater Center was the beginning. Um, I had begun there, afterwards. But at first, it was simply a local theater that was available for anyone that wanted to put on production. Well, on an amateur level, generally speaking. Uh, there was one mm, just a block away called the uh, Winnipeg Playhouse and that was used generally for uh, guild productions, music productions, uh, uh, ballet, things of that nature. Um, I did see theater there and the Winnipeg Little Theater, I think, uh, was housed there for some time. I don't know if it was a permanent home or not. And I just died to get on that stage. I wanted very badly to get on the stage and really only made it on that particular stage once or twice. But for the most part, um, it was with uh, the kinds of stages that Lena Lovegrove would, would uh, come up with for her smaller productions. Um, and uh, then later on, Theater 77 and MTC. And Rainbow Stage, of course. Which MTC was an offshoot, I believe, of uh, the Little Theater and Theater 77. Mm. Yes. In 54, your career began, at least according to this quote, in the play years ago. Mm -hmm. Years ago. Uh, years ago. What, what do you remember that? First? Well, I remember that it was uh, written by Ruth Gordon, a true story, or at least her own uh, kind of story of how she aspired to be an actress and finally ended up on Broadway, went to New York um, with fifty dollars given to her by her her um, father in Boston, in Back Bay, and um, and an address whereby she could uh, uh, turn in a, uh, a telescope that he'd given her for for fifty dollars. That was it, and that's how she could she could last there. He who had been against the whole idea at the beginning, and so it's a charming story, delightful thing. It turned into a film later on called The Actress with uh, Spencer Tracy, Teresa Wright, and uh, Gene Simmons. And uh, yes, the very first time I stepped on stage was in the role of, uh, of the father in that production. Wow. Was it, were you on Kennedy Street at the time? Kennedy Street, I believe, was where the YMHA was, the Hebrew Association, and, uh, and that's where we performed. Yeah, and uh, that's, uh, that's where it happened. We followed up with other productions of the same length of the uh, same duration, Gaslight and very other plays, but uh, years ago was the first one for me at least. Uh, despite his youth and ill-advised makeup, uh, Frank Morris or someone said this, Pinson played his part with vigor. What do you mean by uh, ill-advised? Uh, well, I think probably I've always wanted to look as though I could do a job. I always wanted to look as though I had come from a lot of experience. I never wanted to look as though I was beginning anything for the first time. And I, I got my little makeup together and I arrived. I think I even beat up the sticks of makeup or something to make it look as though I've been in the business forever. And I, I just wanted to appear that way. I didn't want anyone to think that I was starting out. So, of course, having done my makeup for the very first time, Probably I was not as expert at it as I would have liked. And, uh, but even so, I suppose it was all right, except for the fact I was quite young and playing this part that, uh, that called for white hair and so on. Um, and that was the first, uh, that was that particular review. I was, I was quite happy to get it at the time. Uh, if we jump now a number of years later, I met two young actresses who had been in that show at a, at a, during a recent visit to Winnipeg, or at least in the last few years, with another play. 
and they came to see the play and they brought me this review and this was the line that was in the review so they reminded me of how of how it was and, and uh, the very first review that I got in the theater which was uh, great of them and um, for also come by the way yeah. I flung myself at certain roles with uncertain ability and survived with a long way to go um, certain roles with uncertain ability what do you mean um, well, uncertain ability, because in fact I was, I seem to have um, an abundance of that, that recklessness, that, that stuff, that adventure, that, that uh, you can have at a certain young age. Uh, later on that turns into other things, other kinds of fears, doubts, and panic, and so on. But at that time, I, you, you would go as far, to, you'd go as close to the edge as you could go in interpreting roles and... Uh, and going out to get the, to to make make things happen for yourself. Um, this was a career that uh, I was intent on having, but I neither had the money, the support, um, or the formal training to really uh, make that a, a, a you know a, a sure thing. This was simply a way that I was going, and I wanted to make sure that I was going to get there but uh, most definitely uncertain when it came to uh, preparing myself for roles um, on the same stage maybe with performers who have been doing much much more or um, and in new uh, new venues such as television and so on uh, I simply had the um, as you say chutzpah to, to I guess charge ahead and make my mistakes and I didn't mind falling on my face at all it was a certain kind of uh, Thing about it. At the same time, I, I didn't like being a fish out of water, you know, so it was a double kind of thing that was happening. But I certainly had, well, again, that, that marvelous um, um, comeback uh, ability that, that young people have, you know. Oh, well, that's one job, now let's go for another. And there's something about just simply getting a lot of work done, show after show, and the idea of uh, the delight I think one felt in building a resume of, of work. Uh, proof again, proof that you were in the right business. And um, um, I've enjoyed it immensely. I just think it was a tremendous kind of, dis uh, uh, certainly the proper decision for me to make at the time. Yeah. I can't dispense with Winnipeg this quickly without mentioning the Rainbow Stage. And there was apparently one uh, rich anecdote about the stormy weather you had during its production of that. Married. Yes, Just Married was a, one of those uh, gentle little 30s plays, plays that came out of uh, the early 30s, I guess. Um, and uh, the kind of play that the sort of sensibility of, of, of Lena Lovegrove would be, would, would, you know, would be best suited for. Um, and she would dig up these little plays to do, and we would do them. Uh, on that particular occasion, Just Mary took place on a boat, on a ship, if I recall correctly. And regardless of all the other um, things that have been produced on Rainbow Stage, this was, we were following, I think, Hungarian dancers and Ukrainian dancers and so on, uh, as the first drama, first kind of drama on that stage. And the, uh, there was very little there in the way of baffles and whatever else to protect a a thing as uh, fragile as a as a, uh, a theater drama. Uh, so not only were we not heard, but uh, you know, uh, we never kept our place on stage in the length of time because of the terrific uh, uh, storms that were uh, hitting us from all angles. Um, it was a good good theater. It was great fun, good experience, and everything else. And a very light, light piece of of uh, situation drama at the time. But um, again, part of that kind of experience. Was, was both night uh, with one thing with a big break? Well, in a strange way it was, because again, it was little theater, and they were playing at the Playhouse, oh, this will be, uh, you know, that was, that was nice stuff, big stuff uh, to me at that time. Um, I had, uh, I managed to get the years to go thing, and I was in the middle of, uh, had barely begun rehearsals on that, as a matter of fact, and I, overheard someone from the cast of Twelfth Night 
talked to someone of our cast, telling them how things were going up the road kind of thing in their rehearsal period, and that the fellow who was playing the part of Sebastian dropped out or had to drop out through illness or something. I, I overheard this and raced up the street and uh, tried out for and got this part of Sebastian in Twelfth Night. I had my costume fitting even before I came back to my other rehearsal. So never having lit on stage in my entire life was suddenly now um, the proud owner of, uh, of two parts. <laughs> Uh, all happening at once. And I was just uh, a going concern. Didn't know for a second if I could ever be successful or effective in either of those roles, but felt that I had to have them. So, yeah. Felt like the cod piece of the walking. Yes, kind of. Uh, Shakespeare couldn't have been more comfortable. I didn't know uh, what anyone was saying, and they didn't know what I was saying. Oh, well, that's a slightly exaggerated, I think. I might have said it, but I'm not sure. Um, I'm quite certain I had a um, more than a slice of uh, Newfoundland dialect when I when I first went to Winnipeg. I did an awful lot of radio work, and that helped enormously for me to uh, appear as though I was as neutral as anyone else in front of the mic, kind of thing. So all that was important for me, um, and it didn't show for ex for for a very long time because, in fact, each role called for a different kind of. Uh, characterization and approach and so on. But I do recall while I was doing Twelfth Night there did seem to be a, a, a twang there that, that seemed a bit unnecessary or certainly different from everyone else. And I recall we had this going, going, this joke going around that in fact if I, uh, and I remember, well it had to do with, with, with my saying to them, I said, well it's, it's really old English, you know, it's all very old English. You'd be very smart if you picked up on this and in fact, you know, I imagine that the entire production was going to end up <laughs> speaking in the in sort of an old. Some of them actually thought, yes, this might have been the way they spoke. This could have been, this could have been it, you know. Yeah, we're getting very close here. So by the time that thing opened, I think we all sounded as though we came from Harbor Grace or someplace in Newfoundland. The Judy Sinclair advised that your name was too common to be a big star. Don't recall that one. Uh, Christopher Defoe's sword dragging across the stage for most of it. Oh yes, yes. Uh, Christopher was in it. Um, Christopher, Tom Hendry, uh, Judy, Judy's father, Maury Sinclair, who's a old standby there, mainstay actor, and uh, any number of other people. A wonderful character called Andrew Bassett Spears, and played Malvolio, and they were all grand people. We did a lot of work together in various kinds of things and um, it was uh, it was fun to, to be in. And again, it wasn't as though it was happening every week. You, it took time to get these productions on. But um, so that even while we were doing it, there was there was something kind of precious about it, you know. Um, I don't know. It just seemed to be an opportunity. That, that wonderful feeling of getting the roles, first of all, and you know, reading and getting them and the, all of that early stuff that an actor goes through in order to, uh, you know, when putting together a, uh, the career and um, making up his mind whether or not he's going to do it forever or just for fun as a whim or something quite serious. And uh, we, had, we had good times. Well, I gather, uh, we spoke to Tom Henry in July and uh, but you certainly mentioned Winnipeg a lot in your book. Um, and Tom was uh, talked about you quite a bit. Too. Uh, Tom Henry, this was a, re a bit of a, the first time I met him in this Rainbow Stage period. Eh? Or was there in the Winnipeg Little Theater, anyways. Yep. Uh, who was he? Like, who was he? Did he also just kind of get in and on and working, or was he pretty established? Well, in Tom's field, um, Tom, Tom was a chartered accountant, uh, and he wrote and things. He was one of the few people around Winnipeg at the time that was sort of. Uh, anxious to get things off the ground that were not um, well-known, American or English uh, classic plays or, or uh, old standards or whatever. Uh, and he would write uh, children's plays and varying things. Some things would go on. Uh, uh, Tom was one of those, one of those people, a small nucleus of Winnipeg writer. Uh, he also had a radio a farcical kind of uh,
kind of Monty Python type radio show he did, and uh, I was one of the one of the locals on that. We had great fun doing it, and um, again, anything that was original was just wildly exciting and and different and. Uh, it was great fun and great uh, accomplishment to get something other than that, Shakespeare or otherwise, but there was, all, there was some, an extra thrill, I think, in working on a local writer's piece of work or um, trying to get things like that off the ground yourself. And Tom was, Tom was uh, very much responsible for some very good stuff out of there at that time. Uh, and he simply uh, saw the need uh, to th that that someone would have to spearhead this this uh, this new lasting theater in Winnipeg if ever we were going to have one, Tom became that person. Made you know just simply filled it, be regardless of if anyone else ever wanted it or not. He knew that it was a, that it was time to do this as well. First of all, because uh, John Hirsch, another uh, marvelous um, mover and shaker. I think was then making sounds about leaving, and other people would be as well. And Tom talked us all into staying, as a matter of fact, to begin a new theater called the Manitoba Theater Center. And, uh, Tom uh, mentioned one of his well, inspirations, or at least he gave, liked the uh, Canadian players. Did you ever see them in Winnipeg? Then? I did. I did. It was thrilling at the time. Uh, um, and don't forget, this was early enough that every face that ever appeared on television from Toronto, from the center, would be known right across Canada. So not only were we seeing people that we may have seen that week on television, which was a new, a new uh, thing all in itself, but we were aware very quickly of a thing called the Canadian Player. And yet it had only been going one or two years. Maybe even, that might even have been the very first year they took it on the road. But suddenly we were seeing Stratford on the road, and that was, that was terribly exciting. Douglas Campbell, Franny Highland, Bruno, Jerusi, uh, Douglas Rain, all of these people taking part in that particular year, uh, Julius Caesar, St. Joan, uh, I think maybe those two. Um, limited budget, obviously, but very, very stylish and put together in a very, very clever um, contemporary uh, sense. And uh, and that was the coming to town of something that was that was quite special. Uh, um, remember the concert series they used to have for years and years, and the musical and the operas and so on. Well, this was this was on a par with that as a as a kind of a um, as an opportunity to see theater in the in the uh, most professional sense come through town. And I made up my, I made up my mind at that point most certainly that I was going to. Kind of follow that, you know. It did seem like all the jobs were taken you know, at that time. Uh, in as much as uh, they had the TV roles, they had the radio roles, they had the, the big gigs mm -hmm. at Stratford. Uh, didn't you kind of feel you were coming along a bit late? Well, yes, there was a bit of that. Television had been going a few years by then uh, in Toronto, so I. I um, um, and even though the population of the arts industry was not nearly as it is today, it was still, it seemed large at that time. And that maybe uh, you'd, uh, you'd sort of find yourself sitting around waiting for other people to, uh, to desert their, uh, their thrones so that you could sort of get up there and take part or at least find your way in. It was extremely difficult to do. And I had my mind made up at that time that the people who would most likely make this happen were people who had formal Lambda or Rada training in England and things of that nature. Those who had either had the, the courage or the, uh, the money to go and make those things happen. And they would arrive on home turf again completely ready, you know, absolutely ready to do all of the great things that would be available to them. Um, because the whole idea then of, uh, of Canada, um, can the Canadian actor as such, uh, it seemed to be, to my way of thinking anyway, a fairly secure um, understanding that, these, that you're here to stay. You've made a life for yourself and you're going to be able to enjoy that as a way of life. Um, and as I say again, even though there were a fair number of people, we thought, in the industry, 
you still had a feeling that it was fairly controllable. Uh, you didn't, you know, uh, and that if you, that good was good. And if you were good and you could make it work for yourself. And uh, it's really the same old actor story over and over and over again that's been done from the beginning of time, I guess, to prove to yourself, to prove to others. And, uh, and stick with it. You know. Did uh, jobs like at the CBC, uh, CBC radio show you mentioned, which was meant to be quite good, they say. Was that with paying your rent? Was that, or did you have something else on the side? Oh, a lot of stuff on the side. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. If, I mean, what we got on that? No, that was very, very limited time period. That particular thing, but there was radio drama. Um, CBC Wednesday night and things of that nature and where we saw the same players and there were some very uh, very good actors who who uh, held sway there as well and you were lucky to to get in and and be part of all of that so I would simply sit around and take what was coming and uh, hopefully be in time for for um, television and uh, leading roles on stage didn't hurt me that much because they were uh, I at least uh, was becoming known in that area, you know. And with any luck, if television ever got off the ground and things like that, I'd be, uh, I'd be equipped. 